actually, I the, there is a person who appears, and it's sort of vaguely me, but they invent me. So it's quite quite peculiar in the misbehaviour. I I make a speech that they invented that was never done, but they they also because they told me that their person responsible for colour said that everybody was wearing dark clothes. So they decided to put me in a rather smart sort of pink suit, which was not the kind <laughs> of clothes that anyone that I knew who was around in um, feminist politics in those early days would ever be wearing. Um, so that was a bit funny. I, I honestly don't know if I'm meant to be called a professor. People call me a professor. I was a professor when I worked at Manchester University, but then I, uh, when I retired, I wasn't. So I don't know whether you just kind of augustly carry on being a professor, whether you've got a job or not. But anyway, um, I, um, and I, I, res I left the, that, um, the fellow, as a fellow of the Royal Society because I didn't live in London, so I couldn't really go to any of their events and I had to pay money each year and I thought well can't really afford it so I resigned but that 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 information never kind of gets through so I just didn't want to have false claims before I start um and I I'm really pleased that you've been able to come I um I don't know what it's like with you it's pouring with rain here in Bristol and I'm it's a very dreary day um but I I've written this book called Daring to Hope, um, which is a cheerful kind of title. And um, I want to um, describe some of the things that are in it, and then also talk a bit about some of the um, kind of history that um, we got interested in through the women's movement. A lot of the book is about women's liberation because um, I was involved really from 1969. I um, uh, wrote an article um, which appeared in uh, the left paper called Black Dwarf in, nine, in early 1969. And then from that, I was asked by the May Day Manifesto group that was an attempt to bring the left together to do a pamphlet and that was how the pamphlet Women's Liberation and um, the New Politics came about. And uh, in uh, Daring to Hope, I've um, quoted the um, feeling that was there in 1979, because there wasn't really a movement, but there was a, an incipient movement. So there was this peculiar sense that something was happening, but we weren't really sure. And we didn't have a clearly worked out sort of idea of what we were about. Um, and I was trying to understand why it was so difficult to express the, the feelings of discomfort and feelings that we didn't really fit. That was very characteristic of the young women like me who'd got to university. We were very much a minority, particularly um, those of us who came from families where nobody had ever gone to university before. Um, communication for people who have no name, who have not been recognised, who have not known themselves is a difficult business. For women, it's especially difficult. We've accepted for so long man's image of himself and ourselves and the world as his creation we find it almost impossible to conceive of a different past or a different future. Borrowed concepts are like passed down clothes. They fit badly and do not give confidence. We lumber awkwardly about in them or scuttle shamefacedly into obscurity, wondering whether we should do our, their, flies up for us, them. And it was that sense of, um, bewilderment and um, feeling that there were blanket male dominated culture that had an important influence on us early on. Um, 
I gleaned insights from Black Power in America and from Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, and also from a lecture that Edward Thompson had given in 1968 to the adult education um, group in Leeds. And it's called Education and Experience. And it's in uh, one of the collections that Dorothy Thompson put together. Uh, in that, he, it, it, I read it over and over again. And I, um, I just find it interesting every time I read it. He stressed how much can be learned from working class experience while warning of the danger of simply putting the riposte, as he calls it, of anti-intellectualism against the uh, arrogant upper class of appropriation of culture. Um, it, was, it was very difficult to, to find a language to talk about our discontents. And that was really why the small consciousness raising groups were so important. Um, we got the idea of the consciousness raising groups from the Americans, and if people are interesting, I interested that later I could talk a bit about what people have said were the origins of them. But they they made sense to us because we had all these um, aspects of our lives that were never seen as anything to do with politics, and it was important to try to be able to express them and go over them. It's, it's surprising in some ways that um, more written accounts haven't appeared in about the British Women's Liberation Group because um, I think um, that that would mean that there would be a, a wider context for what I'm talking about. But it, it was a very common feeling um, and it was shared by those of us who were socialists as well as women who were just coming into um, women's liberation groups because they'd heard about them and responded. Uh, the first um, groups that we uh, formed began to think about having uh, a, a conference. And originally, again, we, we hadn't got the idea that we were going to create a movement. We thought um, we needed to get together on a larger scale to be able to talk together um, and we hadn't any idea of who many, how, how many people would come. And that was really how the Trade Union College um, Ruskin came to host the, women, the first Women's Liberation Conference in, at the end of February in 1970. Um, the two students there, Sally Alexander, and Ariel Avison, who's um, a great loss, she died in a car accident not long after that conference. She was from Switzerland and she, she, was a, she had a great influence on me because she, she was very conscious of the significance of a, a woman in France called Edith Thomas, who had um, written a book about the women of 1848 in France. And then she um, had written a book about the women in the commune, which was translated as the women in Sendries. And Ariel was doing a thesis on the um, a student movement that preceded the French commune. So we, we shared an interest in um, the history of those um, women. And I, that's what I spoke about at the first Women's Liberation Conference, the um, revolutionary um, participation of women in France. Um, a film is, uh, exists of the first Women's Liberation Conference, and that really brings it out because there we all are. In uh, we've got a lot of long scarves and a lot of old fur coats because um, Granny's fur coats had sort of come into fashion, and a few people had got Afghan coats too. Um, and everybody is talking. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it really gives the excitement. There's not very many visual records of early women's liberation things. So a woman's place is um, really valuable. And they also filmed the, um, it, the first in International Women's Day demonstration of women's liberation the following um, spring. Um, there was uh, 
that was when uh, several thousand women supported by men marched through the sleet and snow through the, the West End singing, um, stay young and beautiful if you want to be loved. And they also did a great dance that Buzz Goodbody, who was in the Communist Party and who worked at the, um, for the Royal Shakespeare Company, sort of, she did the choreography with them. So they, they did it very well. And dancing on a demonstration has a great impact <laughs> on, on passers-by because they all stop and they all smile, whereas when, when you're sort of just marching along, they're kind of, what's this? Um, it, it was a very visual demonstration. And that, at that time, there were lots of ideas of bringing in all kinds of art and um, creativity into left politics. So the women's liberation movement continued to do that. Um, the other visual record is the of, of these very of this very early period is the, a lot of photographs that were taken by Sally Fraser, as she was known then. She later became Shandan Fraser, but her photographs are available through the name of Sally Fraser. And they're, they're wonderful photographs. I, some are in my book, um, including one of the women's liberation uh, contingent on uh, an industrial march against the industrial relations bill in um, the early 70s. It's, uh, um, it's got a lot of people, including Raphael Samuel <laughs> in the shot by chance. Uh, Raphael, um, as many of you I'm sure know, was um, really a key figure in creating the history workshop as um, things that, uh, conferences, and he worked at Ruskin at that time. So my um, book talks about um, these big events, but it also talks about the um, local activity that we were doing. And my particular perspective and situation comes from being a socialist feminist in the East London. So that's my, particular perspective and obviously if other people were writing they probably would have a, a, a different perspective but there was a sign a really socialist feminists were pretty uh, in terms both numerically and in terms of publications and in terms of um, initiating a lot of activity were prominent in women's liberation in the 1970s certainly until the late 70s. And um, I think that, that uh, the memory of that has disappeared because as it became harder and harder to talk about socialism, um, the memory of what the feminist movement was became divested in many ways of its broader connections, which was, came a lot through the socialist movement and through women participating in other um, movements as well. I mean, lots of People were involved in um, movements around peace, um, movements around race, um, specific groups were involved in issues around um, lesbian politics and um, uh, challenging the ways in which both lesbian women and um, homosexual men were um, you know, categorized as somehow deviant. So there was, um, a very strong impulse around both sexual politics, but also connected to um, wider issues about um, immigration and um, claimants, for example. So women locally were active in community groups and the kinds of things that people were campaigning for were nurseries, um, refuges, for women who'd experienced domestic violence because um, there, there wasn't such, they didn't have such things before. And similarly, rape uh, crisis centers. Um, and there were also women's centers. I, I was involved in one in Essex Road. Um, it was sort of on the edge of Islington heading towards Hackney, which is where I lived. And Essex Road 
uh, Women's Centre had some very strong links with all the teachers in the local schools. So we used to go around and talk about women's liberation in all the local schools. And we um, also had, there was a group with, on, about women's health and sexuality. Um, there were women connected to the Women's Centre who worked with women in prison because um, Holloway Prison was nearby. And also um, there was groups discussing lesbian and gay sexuality. So there was a really a, a lot of different kinds of activities. Um, I got involved um, with some people in the, I was in a group which was called Arsenal Women's Liberation Group, which sounds incredibly um, ferocious. But actually, it just was called that because Hermione Harris, whose house was where we met, was near Arsenal Tube. So we used to meet at Hermione, so we became Arsenal Women's Liberation Group. And um, I got involved when May Hobbs asked international socialist women to um, give support to um, her campaign to unionise women cleaners. And the International Socialist Women asked me if I would put the message around to people in the workshop. And so people met in my bedroom. That, and our main meeting places were people's rooms and bedrooms because people didn't really have very many, many rooms. So they, they lived in their bedroom. And um, that May Hobbs came to talk. And that was how a, a group of us got involved with going out to try to get cleaners to join the, tra the Transport and General Workers Union. And then subsequently the Civil Service Union because the Civil Service Union gave more support and um, the support was very important to the cleaners because they were in such a vulnerable position as contract workers. I think a lot of trade unionists thought that was very marginal at the time because they didn't have that many women who, you know, were sort of part-time and um, contract workers. But the, the, there were increasing numbers of women going into the workforce in this period. And so I think that, uh, that there was a tendency to see the, the, the most vulnerable groups as, as pretty marginal. But actually, what is sobering is the ways in which the conditions, the insecure and um, precarious conditions of work became wider and wider. When, I mean, it's in some ways a good thing that you don't, don't actually see the future all the time because it could be pretty depressing. Um, but we did um, try to organize and we did have some gains. The problem was that the, the employers could destroy those by moving the cleaners on if when they went to a new sent off to a new building um, the gains that they'd made then didn't apply but I'm very pleased to say that there are some young people now who have been organizing with um, contract cleaners and um, have been more strategic in many ways than we were about it and I think have made um, some headway but it was different in France because they actually didn't have that um, legal requirement. You could still, um, it still counted when they, that when people moved from one building to another. Um, we were um, trying to not only um, meet needs, but we did want to create alternatives which would carry some kind of alternative values and um, the nurseries that were set up, community nurseries, were really important in this. Quite quickly, there, um, there were links that were formed between the community nurseries and the general state nurseries where the workers were also unionizing. So there was a, a locally in many places, there could be a combination of unionized um, nursery workers and also people campaigning and being involved in the in the community 
um, you, nurseries that had often started as a squat but carried alternative values. I must say that the alternative values on the children's food were pretty hilarious at my, my son's nursery. They, <laughs> there would be one kind of cook who would say, children like um, hamburgers, so I'm going to cook hamburgers for children. And other people would say, no, no, children should be eating yogurt and cucumber and all these things. And I can remember a ferocious argument in the community nursery management, well, it was the you know, voluntary group, the management, where we went over the question of the food that the children should eat. That was in the uh, late 70s. <laughs> the, so it wasn't always kind of easy to create the alternative because people had different visions of, of how you should be prefiguring. Um, I became interested in thinking about um, whether there'd been people like us in the past. And the, again, the kind of history that was available was not really, um, there wasn't very much about people who were socialists and feminists. So I, I started to research um, into um, the, the obvious places to look like. I, I went to Amsterdam and read the papers of Sylvia Pankhurst. And I realized that the image of the suffrage movement as being you know, very upper class was not really right because there were all these examples of um, working class women involved in suffrage. And I was teaching in a WA class in Stanmore in North London in the mid 70s when um, a, um, my class secretary said to me that uh, there was a former suffragette um, who'd been a socialist for the First World War who lived locally. And um, Florence Exton Han. Her husband was Maurice Han, who'd been a trade unionist in the Shop Workers Union, been an official. Um, he was in his 90s, and uh, Florence was in her 80s when I went to see them. Um, and when I met Florence, I remember sitting opposite her in their suburban house in Stanmore. And there she was, she was 82, and she had white hair that was swept up on her. very blue eyes. Um, she'd heard tales of Americans burning bras and her first remark on women's liberation was, of course, you don't believe in trade unions like we did. And we stared at each other in mutual incomprehension. Um, I had the idea of suffrage as being, you know, mainly middle class, upper middle class women who weren't very interested in unions. And my and she saw us as burning our bras all the time. My uh, understanding of women's liberation from Florence was really different. She came from a working class socialist family in uh, Southampton, and uh, her mother was. They were parents were in the Social Democratic Federation, and her mother was an advanced woman who cycled in bloomers. Um, but they always took a skirt when they went bicycling, as she said, to cover up when they reached town because it was so shocking to see women in bloomers. She was a trade unionist. From a young age, then after the um, suffrage movement died down as the First World War, um, she and Morris um, kept, were part of the No Conscription Fellowship. And they were organisers for the South East, opposed to the war. And um, after the war, they put all the names of the South East No Conscription Fellowship into a biscuit tin in there and buried it in the... Um, they, well, they buried the biscuit tin in the garden. They dug it up in... 
need to be raided then by the police who Florence said were looking for subversives. So uh, my account of her life appeared in Red Rag. I uh, was um, to go and visit Maurice Han afterwards. I kept in touch with him, but um, Florence died. Um, and he always liked to, although he had moved to the right, he liked to have uh, debates about things like workers' control and things like that. Um, he gave me permission to write about Florence while admonishing me, do not link her too closely with women's lib. Unbeknown to Morris, when I met Florence, she'd whispered that he was a terrible male chauvinist and later warned me that her husband was not interested in any women's movements. Still, I was grateful to Morris, for he passed on, oh Lord, these things keep coming off. Um, he passed on several of Florence's books, including one about an early 20th century campaign for housing homeless women. And I'd never known um, about that campaign. And I gave the, the book to the Working Class Movement Library in Salford. Um, the, so Florence gave me a different perspective on the suffrage movement and that kind of contact was really important. Another very different um, going back in time contact was with Dora Russell, who um, I'm sure you've heard of. I corresponded with her at first and I think she was a bit wary. And then um, we met in London and when she came to see her son, I um, was very interested to hear about the um, work, the, the workers' birth control group that Dora had been involved in. And she made me realize that there was a much wider movement for sexual reform linked to um, the left than I'd understood. I um, went uh, to visit her with Paul Atkinson in 19. Um, 74, and um, she was extremely uh, uh, frank. Like, I, I, I remember being once in a, um, in a in a in a kind of coffee shop at uh, London School of Economics with her, and she had a real sort of foghorn voice, which I think she probably developed through arguing with people in the past. And she said. Um, the trouble with men is they just don't understand women's orgasms, at which point the whole place just completely stopped and froze and gazed at us in complete sort of bewilderment and horror. <clears throat> and I was, I was rather embarrassed, but Dora didn't bat an eyelid. Um, she was uh, completely without embarrassment. She, it was exciting for me to find that she'd actually met two women who I was extremely interested in. Um, Alexandra Kolintai, who was uh, in, involved with the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union in the early days, and Stella uh, Brown, who was an iconoclastic Canadian woman who um, argued for abortion um, rights for women. In, in a very early time when, you know, women were still struggling to get basic contraception advice. So I found there was a kind of connection between these um, people who were interested in radical ideas and also in, in um, sexual politics. And it was through these connections that I um, also got involved in eventually writing a biography much later about uh, Edward Carpenter, who was also um, talking about, um, in, in a period when it was really illegal to do that, talking about um, gay men. So quite a, a few of these early um, origins of interest in women's history, which people like me, and Sally Alexander, who I mentioned as one of the people who were studying at Ruskin and uh, organized the first conference, and Anna Davin, who um, 
wrote about women's history in the early days, uh, I think both sides really life in the everyday life of uh, working class women. Um, but I, I was always interested in movements and in why um, movements start at a particular time and what kind of people had networks and links. And I think that was um, a difference really in, in interest that I had from um, the, the kind of work that became important for women's history. It uh, eventually um, took me off in much later time in the 2000s to writing about Edward Carpenter, as I said, but also I wrote a book about the, the people who were in a local, the local group in Bristol who were involved in the socialist movement and in um, were advanced women who um, admired Carpenter. And I did that in a book called Rebel Crossings. But the, the, funny, the funny thing is that the books that took years and years and years of life were, didn't really have um, as much popularity as the books that I did much uh, more quickly, um, which were in the very early days, um, which were part of uh, my early excitement and interest in women's history. I um, want to read you um, a poem about um, a man called Harry McShane that some of you may know. He, I'm going to end with two, with two poems. He, Harry McShane spoke at the History Workshop Conference in 1976 that was on the theme of workers' education. And um, he was 85. Uh, when he spoke and could remember the, the revolutionary left days in Glasgow in the early 20th century. I, I, I knew a bit about uh, Glasgow's socialist past from a woman called Annie Davison, who Jean McCrindle and I interviewed. But um, I, um, she was, you know, she talked about the Independent Labour Party and the socialist and anarchist Sunday schools, I didn't even know there were anarchist Sunday schools before she mentioned it. Workers, Esperanto, and the clarion players. But Harry McShane communicated uh, another Glaswegian left with this profound sense of import. And I've put the poem in the book. An old man speaks with precision of a lost revolutionary tradition. He tells of John McLean weaning Marxism out of the pain of 1914. Unfamiliar with a microphone, accustomed to speaking with his own voice, honoured to be asked to talk again, conscious of the responsibility of proletarian education. He studies his notes, a weariness in his shoulders passes as he takes his bearings. Standing, he draws strength from comrades long ago and the young who surround him now, remembering so many meetings and John McLean speaking, 60 years or so passing in between. He is still learning, assessing consequences, analyzing fragmentation, still considering the odds for and against working class emancipation. He loves Marxism and nods to an earlier tradition of Scottish hair splitting disputation, remembering so many meetings and John McLean speaking, 60 years passing in between. He knows we need more than economic argumentation, more than political education, more than the state and revolution, communism, he says, is only the beginning. He's pushing possibilities, bringing reality to bear on longing, bearing an earthly basis for the dream, holding the dialectic respectfully in two hands, remembering so many meetings, 
and John McLean speaking, 60 years passing in between, an old communist conceives an embryo of longing. And those were the days when being 80, 85 seemed very old to me, but it doesn't now. <laughs> and this uh, finally is one that I wrote about history in the early 70s, as I was beginning to research a bit more deeply and began to realize that um, it's um, always more complicated than you think when you actually get down to researching stuff. I cannot quite get hold of history. I take it around with me. Uh, bags and parcels I never quite explore. One day I'll go right through. One day I'll really know exactly what I lug about. But somehow I never find the time to settle down and search. I often want to fling the lot out into time, jump on a moving bus and steam into the future, driving a red double decker. Instead, I stand sniffing the dust, my parcels wrapped around me, bolstering the night. And now I must say, I kind of think, ah, oh, time is passing and I have an awful lot of books and the decision of 